Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be learning about the 2004 movie, The Alamo. And to help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, we'll be chatting with professor, historian, and author Stephen Harden. Stephen was also a historical consultant for the movie that we'll be chatting about today, so we'll get some extra insight into the production of the film as well. Before we connect with Stephen, though, let's set up our game. Two truths and a lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, the final assault on the Alamo took place in darkness. Number two, the Battle of the Alamo was a fight between Mexico and the United States. Number three, William Travis was temporarily in charge of the Alamo when the siege began. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. But don't worry. Of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Stephen Harden about the historical accuracy of the Alamo. At the very beginning of the movie, we learn a bit about the Alamo itself prior to the events that we see in the movie. And according to the film, the Alamo was a Spanish mission that was established in 1718. But over the centuries, it ended up being more of a fort than a mission due to its proximity to settlements nearby. Then a little later in the movie, we learn about the Alamo as it relates to the timeline of the movie in the 1830s. We learn this from the character of Lieutenant Colonel J.C. Neal, who tells William Travis upon his arrival that the Alamo was named after a Spanish cavalry unit called the Alamo de Paris. It has the most cannons of any fort west of the Mississippi, and it is the only thing standing between Santa Ana's army and the Texas settlements. So how well did the movie do telling the history of the Alamo itself leading up to the events that we see in the movie? Very well. The uh, introductory text that you see at the beginning of the movie was actually written by my good friend, uh, Colonel Alan Huffines, who wrote uh, a wonderful book called Blood of Noble Men. Uh, it's, a, it's a day-by-day chronology of the siege of the Alamo. And uh, that's smack on. And the dialogue that uh, J.C. Neal uh, relates, uh, played to perfection by uh, the Texas uh, actor Brandon Smith, uh, I was so proud of that scene because it really does fill in in a not a polemical way, but just a conversational way. Well, here's the skinny on 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 this place, and it seemed very natural, I think, in the in the movie that uh, J.C. Nell should be telling Travis who who is, after all, just arrived on the scene and and really doesn't know the background to this place. I thought that was smack on. Yeah, it seems like he's just. Giving him a welcome tour. That's right. Uh, that, that's how we envision it. He, you know, he, he's giving him the cook's tour, and then of course <laughs> springs it on him that, hey, I'm I'm about to leave, and you're in command. What? You know, I just got here. But uh, but that's uh, historically accurate. Uh, actually, uh, he received word that uh, his family was seriously ill in uh, in Mina. Uh, which is uh, what modern-day Bastrop. And, uh, you know, at that point, they're not expecting uh, the Mexicans to arrive until at least uh, March 15th. He says this in the movie. He says, you know, your greatest challenge was keeping the regulars and the volunteers from from killing each other. Uh, But uh, Santana, and we we show this in the film too, uh, steals a march by having a bitter uh, march in the winter. And, and, you know, normally South Texas is pretty temperate, but the uh, the winter of 1836 was the coldest and wettest in human memory. Uh, General Fiasola, who, who, who writes about the weather conditions, uh, says that there's, uh, that there's 14 inches of snow on the ground in South Texas. Funny thing, we were we had all the soldado extras set up to do that scene, and uh, we had brought in all sorts of fake snow, you know. 
And so what happens the night before we shoot that scene? It snows uh, in Dripping Springs. So uh, that was that was pretty cool. Of course. <laughs> A lot of movies make up fictional characters or create composite characters. So I want to ask about some of the main characters that we see in the movie. And we mentioned some of them already. We see uh, William Travis being in charge of the Alamo, uh, who was temporarily in command, according to the movie, after Lieutenant Colonel Neil leaves. There's also Jim Bowie, who is leading a volunteer militia. Davy Crockett arrives a little bit later, but when he arrives in the movie, it's pretty clear that he thought the fighting was already over, so he doesn't seem to be there to fight. Uh, there's also Sam Houston, who is not at the Alamo, but he plays a big part in the movie. And then on the Mexican side, the key figure is General Santa Ana, who you mentioned is traveling in the dead of winter. The movie says over 300 miles to get to the Alamo. Is that pretty accurate, the way that the movie sets up these main characters? It's extremely accurate. Uh, all of those were real people, and uh, the uh, the script reflects pretty pretty carefully i think now of course there's we took some liberties always do in a movie and uh you know interesting thing when I, my, my first meeting with the director john lee hancock it was alan huffines and uh, myself and uh he you know he told us look i want we, i want you guys to work on this movie as as advisors and I want the movie to be as historically accurate as possible. He says, now let me tell you what that means. He said, first, it's got to work as a movie. or It doesn't matter if it's historically accurate or not because nobody's going to be watching it. So I may, for dramatic purposes, uh, combine some characters. I might telegraph uh, uh, some things. Uh, but that's just standard operating procedure uh, because history is complex and movies have to be simple. And I got that. I understand. I mean, I, I watch movies. I, you know, so I, I was perfectly uh, okay with that. Uh, but but he, he said something that impressed me then and impresses me now. He said, uh, I don't want to make any errors in ignorance. He said, if we depart from histor the historical record or historical truth or historical fact, I want to do that for creative and cinematic reasons, not simply because I didn't know any better. So your job is to be whispering in my ear, saying, well, this is how it really went down. And, uh, you know, the first thing when you're a historical advisor for a movie, and a lot of, a lot of people can't do this, and, and they're ineffective as, uh, as a historical advisor, they don't have to take your advice. But here's the thing, and I give him credit for it. Uh, when I went to him, I said, look, John, this is, this is how it really went down he said yeah but we always had we always had the conversation and uh when he did depart from the historical record it was for cinematic purposes and uh you know he was he was right you know heck i i tried to talk him out of the best scene in the movie because I didn't understand it until I saw it. And when I saw it, I went, brilliant. So, you know, sometimes you, you should ignore the historical advisor. Which scene specifically are you referring to there? Actually, the scene where uh, Crockett serenades uh, the Mexican soldiers. I, I had the script. And I'm, and I'm reading, you know, and, and I said, you know, Crockett says uh, that that's pretty. Uh, uh, talking about the the Guayo, I said, J John Lee, I've heard the Guayo, and uh, it's a lot of things, but it's it's not a pretty tune. It's a it's a menacing tune. And what I what I had not realized is he had the composer completely redo the the Guayo, so it. 
you know, worked for the fiddle accompaniment. And uh, I, I think that is the best scene in uh, this movie or any other Alamo movie. You know, I've talked to several people over the years. This is why I just love that scene where Crockett plays the fiddle. I said, yeah, it's pretty good. And, and of course, it's a testament to Billy Bob's acting skill, but it's, uh, it's also a testament to John Lee's writing. He, he, he wrote that scene. So what, what were we trying to do with that scene? Well, we do know for a fact that David, David Crockett did play the fiddle at the Alamo. He kept up people's spirits. So we wanted to do a hat tip to the, to the real Crockett. But we also wanted to show the man's humanity. And uh, I think that scene just did it perfectly. Uh, and, and in fact, that scene was so uh, effective. If, you, if you'll recall, we end the movie with a reprise uh, to that scene. That wasn't the original intention. We had a whole different ending. and In fact, shot a whole different ending, which showed Juan Seguin returning to San Antonio. There's the, you know, he, you see him riding down the hill. There's the Alamo in ruins. Uh, and he's going back, and he, he meets uh, Tejano, and he says, hey, you're back. He said, yes. He said, I, I have a promise to keep, because he had promised. In, which, is, which would have been a, a great ending, but uh, when John Lee just saw how, how beautiful uh, the, the scene was, he, he wanted to reprise back to that. And I, you know, I, I think that was probably a good choice. If we head back to the movie, we get a little bit of backstory about why the battle happens. The Texians, as they call themselves, uh, they swore allegiance to Mexico under the Federalist Constitution of 1824. But Santa Anna personally tore up that document and named himself Supreme Dictator, who considers himself the Napoleon of the West. And they don't want to swear allegiance to a dictator, so they intend to form their own country. And according to Sam Houston in the movie, it'll be a country that will be recognized by every nation in the world. Not to skip too far ahead in the movie, but later on, we see that Houston gets a letter from President David G. Burnett. So the impression that I got while I was watching the movie was that the Texians wanted to be independent from Mexico and the United States. They wanted to be their own country. And Santa Ana, of course, isn't too keen on letting that happen without a fight. Is that a good explanation of the why behind the battle at the Alamo? Yes, it's simplistic, because what you have to understand is every one of the delegates there at the town of Washington on, on uh, March 2nd, 1836, when they declared Texas independent from Mexico, every one of those delegates expected that Texas would be annexed into the federal union. But declaring independence was a necessary first step to make that happen. I think most of those guys probably thought that Texas would, would join the Union uh, maybe six months, maybe a year, but not the 10 years that it ultimately took. They uh, underestimated the vehemence of, of the Northeastern voting bloc of course, if Texas comes in the Union, there's no question that it will come in as a slave state. And the Northeastern Bloc, uh, they don't want another slave state. And uh, they and did, did block the, uh, the annexation of Texas for a full decade. But yeah, basically, Texas is it's going to be its own country, at least for a little while. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal, and especially it's the ultimate goal of Sam Houston, is to wrest Texas away from Mexico and add it to the federal firmament. And if possible, <laughs> during the administration of Andrew Jackson, because, you know, Sam Houston had a, a, a special relationship with Andrew Jackson. Many historians have said that Jackson was a father figure, of course, uh, Houston lost his own father when he was quite young. So uh, Jackson had been a mentor to Houston. And, and I think he wanted to be, because he had messed up 
Houston had. Uh, he had been uh, governor of, of Tennessee, the youngest governor in, in, in Tennessee history, had a bad marriage, uh, had to resign the governorship. If his rise uh, had been uh, meteoric, his fall was, was even more so. And so when he comes to Texas, he is coming as a ruined man, and he wants to recreate himself and do something big and, and, and show Jackson, look, I'm not a screw-off. And uh, I, I think he wants to, to present Texas uh, as a present to Jackson with a bow on top. Here, this is, I, I did this for you. And, uh, you know, he, he wasn't able to do it during the, the Jackson's uh, administration. But the last act of Jackson's administration is he recognizes on, on behalf of the United States, he recognizes the independence of Texas, but that's a far cry from accepting uh, uh, Texas into the Union, which even, and, and, and Andrew Jackson was an expansionist, but, uh, but even Andrew Jackson, I mean, Andy by God Jackson uh, didn't have the clout to pull that off then, you know, it, 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 not old hickory, but young hickory. And the guys uh, for Polk, you know, was uh, uh, finally made that happen. But uh, that 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 story was uh, far too complex to to tell in a movie. You know? Sure, it makes sense. You have to simplify that. Well, on the other side of that, there's there were three key sequences in the movie that stood out to me that gave insight into General Santa Anna as a military leader. In one of those, we see him ordering the execution of some of his own soldiers. Maybe they were deserters or something. Movie doesn't get too far into that, but we see him doing that. You're right. We don't really get into that, but what that is supposed to represent is the uh, rape of Zacatecas. Zacatecas, a federalist state that resisted uh, his, uh, uh, that is to say, Santana's dictatorial regime. And he took his centralist army into Zacatecas and absolutely crushed uh, the Zacatecas militia, and then unleashed his soldiers on the town. So that's the sort of shorthand. If you know about Zacatecas, you go, oh, yeah, that's supposed to be Zacatecas. Okay, that ma- that makes sense. No, that makes sense. Now that you explain that. A, a little bit later, we hear him not wanting to wait for a cannon to attack Yelmo. He wants his soldiers, or his generals say, I don't remember the exact line, but they, you know, like we're going to lose a lot of men if we just attack if we don't wait for this cannon that's coming and he says something like what are the lives of soldiers but so many chickens uh, and then a little bit later almost counter to that there's a scene in the movie where santa anna allows some civilians in the alamo to leave we see a lot of people taking up that offer before the inevitable attack and it almost seems a little contradictory to him not really caring about the lives of the soldiers but then he's almost has you know indifference to human life in in some cases how well did the movie do showing Santa Anna as a military leader? That line, what are the lives of, of soldiers but so many chickens? Uh, that is an actual quote from one of his soldiers. I mean, that is a line straight out of history. He said that exact thing. So I was glad that we were able to get that in. Uh, the character of Santana is very interesting because in the first part of the movie, he comes across sort of like a buffoon. And there is that one scene, just one scene, where he goes off on, uh, I think it was General Castrion. He just really, he says, you know, we, we, you know, we just started our country and now these pirates are trying to take us from where we have got to make this thing. And you realize for the first time, this guy can be charismatic. This guy can be passionate. And you, you, okay, I can understand why they would be willing to follow this guy because you, this is the first time in the movie that we've actually seen that this guy has some fire in the belly. And that scene was so important for that reason. But up to that, you know, he's been, you know, kind of a sybaritic character, which he was. But uh, I think it was important that, uh, and, and we were criticized at the time for 
sort of giving the Mexican point of view. And one critic said, well, would you know, would you have made a movie about World War II and, you know, given the Nazi point of view? Well, that's, no, that's ridiculous. I think enough time has passed now that, that we can be more ob- objective. And I think it was important that we kind of give the Mexican perspective for, uh, to, you know, so, uh, yeah, I, I like that scene, not only because it's so true to, to history, because it, it works cinematically. And and you remember in that scene they they say, Okay, this is this is how we're going to attack the Alamo. And how many movies, you know, really get into the tactics of a battle? You know, and then when after you've explained, okay, here's the Alamo and Cost comes in from this way, and Duque comes in from this way, and Romero comes in from this way. And then, you know, when we shoot those scenes, oh, okay, that's that's the plan. So, uh, yeah, the, no other Alamo movie has ever done that. And I was, I was really proud of that sequence. When the siege in the movie first starts, we do see Jim Bowie riding out to meet some of Santa Ana's men to try to negotiate a truce. And then from the walls of the Alamo, Travis sees it. He's not happy. And so he orders a cannon to be fired. (laughs) Needless to say, it put a pretty quick end to the negotiations. Uh, And then Santa Ana orders a red flag with a skull to be flown. The movie explains it as saying, uh, meaning death to the traitors. Can you give a little bit more historical context around what, if any, negotiations happened between Santa Ana and the men in the Alamo? Well, that did happen on the first day. The Mexicans arrived in San Antonio on February 23rd, 1836. Uh, Travis, the acting Alamo commander, because J.C. Neal is the Alamo commander, but he's, he's elsewhere. So he leaves uh, Travis in charge, and unwelcome guest arrive before Neil can get back. So it's Travis we remember, and not J.C. Neal. So uh, you know, J.C. Neal misses out on his chance to be a Texas hero, which he does regularly. It's he's an interesting character, but uh, uh, yeah, that happened. Uh, it wasn't uh, Bowie that went out. But another guy. But again, for cinematic reasons, we need to make it. Bo- the guy did deliver a letter from Bowie where he says, uh, basically says, uh, you know, can we come to some sort of terms? And he's told, uh, well, yeah, you can surrender at discretion, which, you know, no terms at all. You know, Bowie, uh, who has a foot. In the in the Tejano community, who speaks uh, fluent Spanish, you know, I think maybe he thought, you know, maybe maybe we can negotiate. And when he finds out that he can't, uh, I think he becomes as committed uh, to uh, defense as anybody else. But again, the movie shows this. I mean, as as the siege begins, Bowie is a critically sick man. And uh, by by the 24th, he has collapsed completely and will be bedridden for, for the rest of the siege. So Bowie, notwithstanding being a major character, really doesn't take a, a, an active role. I mean, he's on his back. Uh, when we do see him, uh, you know, Travis at one point goes in to see him after he speaks to the garrison. But he's, uh, he says, yeah, I, I heard it, but he's, he's not out there with the guys and wouldn't have been. So this is the ridiculous thing about all other Alamo movies is that, it, that even though Bowie is desperately ill, I mean, he, 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 he kills 20 Mexican soldiers flat on his back, you know? And uh, when we shot Bowie's death scene, we wanted it to be, I mean, we wanted to show him trying to put up resistance, but when he gets off two shots and he's, he's reaching for his knife, but doesn't get it. In fact, uh, Bowie probably was completely incoherent when the Mexicans broke into the room because some of the Mexican accounts 
sort of disparage him. He said, well, he was hiding under his covers like a woman. He wasn't hiding under his covers. He was, he was deathly ill. Of course, Mexican soldiers wouldn't have known that. But, uh, you know, it's just too bad that uh, they couldn't have uh, seen Bowie at his best. You know, uh, fate was very unkind uh, to Jim Bowie. Well, once the Mexicans do arrive in the movie, we kind of get the sense that there are thousands in Santa Ana's army, but we don't really, it doesn't, there's not a kind of clear, okay, this is how many is in the, the Mexican army and this is how many are defending. We can just, from the visuals, it's very clear that the defenders in the Alamo are heavily outnumbered. What sort of numbers were there on either side? Well, when the siege starts, uh, Travis has about 150 men. And you've got uh, the reinforcements from Gonzalez. That's another 32. The Mexican sources, after the battle, say uh, 250, between 250, 257. And that's uh, created a, a controversy. Where did those extra guys come from? Well, maybe uh, those guys uh, were ill. You know, maybe they were in the hospital. But it's been speculated that some of those people may have actually, because, you know, we we know nothing. The last letter Travis writes from the Alamo is March 3rd. Of course, the Alamo falls on March 6th. And there's a three-day period where we know almost nothing about what's going on inside the Alamo. And it's been speculated that some of Fannin's men uh, from Goliad may have cut their way in during those three days, and that would account for the higher number of Alamo defenders. You know, we knew that we couldn't get in to the weeds like that. So uh, we have uh, Crockett looking at all of the Mexican soldiers flooding in to San Antonio and telling Travis, uh, we're going to need a lot more men. We're outnumbered, which is all the average viewer probably needs to know. Another thing I'm assuming is going to be because of the movie, just compressing the timeline. We do see at the very beginning, there's 13 lines etched into rock, you know, the siege lasting for 13 days. We don't see this happen 13 times. You mentioned earlier the uh, Deguayo, but we do see enough to get kind of that there's probably this cadence. They they play the song, and then at the end of the song, there's a bombardment with cannon fire, and there's a brief line of dialogue where Travis says that they're bombarding each night so that the defenders don't get any sleep. Were they actually bombarding each night of the siege, like the movie says? Yes, it, except the last night. And uh, we think that, that Santana probably did that on purpose so that they would, you know, lull into slumber. And the plan was, and the reason he attacked at 5.30 in the morning, you know, unlike John Wayne, unlike almost all other Alamo movies that show the, Al- the Battle of the Alamo, or the final assault taking place in broad daylight, we show it accurately. It, it, that battle was in, in darkness. By the time and pe- people, you know, dawn at the, McCardle's dawn at the Alamo. And when, actually, by the time the sun came up, it was done. That battle lasted about 90 minutes. So uh, it was, for all intents and purposes, a night battle. And uh, he did that for a couple of reasons. He, he actually wanted to be up and over the walls before the, the Texians could rally. But also... And, and, and I learned this very forcefully several years ago when I did a, a, a reenactment uh, at, the, at the John Wayne set. And uh, at 5.30, we heard, you know, rockets and the Mexicans are attacking and we all ran in. It was cold and I went, I ran to the north wall and I peered over the wall. And you know what I saw? Not a darn thing because it was pitch dark. You cannot shoot a target you cannot see. And, uh, you know, I think the Mexican casualties, which have have been seriously inflated over the years, actually, uh, the the Mexican casualties at the Battle of the Alamo were, were, were minimal. 
uh, simply because uh, the the assault was well planned. But yeah, it was a, it was a night battle, and I was so glad that that we did that right, that we showed that. There's only been one other movie, Alamo: The Price of Freedom, that shows down at the uh, River Center in San Antonio. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was I was very pleased with with the battle scenes. Earlier, you did mention that. Um Texas joining the union would have been a slave state. And in the movie, there is a, a small part of the movie where we see a couple slaves. And one of the conversations, one of them says to the other that Mexican law says there are no slaves. So he gives them the Spanish phrase to say, I am black. I don't shoot. Basically letting them know that they're not a soldier and and, and let them live. What was the battle at the Alamo like for the black people that were there? Horrific. But in fact, and, and I was happy. That we one of the characters that we show is Joe, who is Travis's body servant. Now, what we don't show, and I'm almost certain that we shot this, but in the theatrical cut, we, we never know what happens to Joe. But in fact, Joe survived uh, because he was able to convince the and 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 they almost killed him, but a Mexican officer saw that he was a black man, presumably a slave, and he's and he told his soldiers, no, stand down. This guy's not our enemy. Uh, but he was wounded. Uh, he was he was bayoneted. But uh he survived and uh actually what we know, much of what we know about the final assault uh, comes from Joe. And even though he was illiterate a lot of people wrote down what he said. So, yeah, we got, you know, sort of a, a hat tip that, yes, there were uh, there were African-Americans inside the Alamo. And, uh, you know, it makes it a more complex story. You know, one of the one of my proudest moments as a historical advisor. Patrick Wilson, a young man who played Travis. And I was so pleased that they got a guy. Travis, you know, Travis never saw uh, his 27th birthday. And Patrick at the time was 28. So he, he's a young guy. And always uh, they cast Travis as a, as a much older man. You know, Lawrence Harvey springs to mind. Uh, so uh, I was glad that the age was right, but there's that scene where he's telling the the two slaves, look, if you have any time, you know, when, when they, you have a spare time, you need to be digging this well. And, you know, Bowie's slave uh, resents having to do that. He says, you know, what, what's the line? He said, it's not enough that we have to fetch their water. Now we have to find it too. And uh, when, when Patrick was the line read, he he was coming off like a like a harsh boss. You know, really, you know, if you have any time, you need to be doing that. And I called John Lee. I said, John Lee, in the accounts, in the slave accounts, what they say they resent the most was the condescension of their masters. The assumption that they're like children. So instead of having Patrick read the line angry, why don't we have him read the line as if he is talking to a dull six-year-old? And the scene just worked so much better. That was the take that they used in the movie. And uh, that was that, that was one of those days that my presence there really made a difference. Yeah, that, I mean, the, the, the scene worked really well. And I don't remember many other Alamo movies even touching on that side of the battle at all. Well, that's right. And, uh, you know, I think it was important uh, for John Lee to get that in. And, uh, of 
course, I, I endorsed that. I was pleased to, you know, I came late to the project. I mean, we had, we had the script was written. And in fact, uh, my first meeting with, with John Lee, he had sent Alan and I uh, the script. And frankly, when I read it for the first time, I, I was pleasantly surprised because it was clear to me that someone had done their homework. You know, they knew what they were talking about, you know. And and uh, so John Lee said, uh, have you had a chance to read the script? And I said, yes. And uh, there is much uh, in this script that is good. He said, well, I'm, I'm hearing a but. I said, yeah. I said, uh, none of these people speak as if they're living in 1836. You have them speaking a modern vernacular. And he said, well, is that something you could help us with? I said, I think we can. And the first thing Alan and I did is we sat down with the script. And uh, we, we put some period vernacular into, in, into the script uh, when... Uh, when Crockett, on the first day of the siege, comes into uh, Travis's quarters and says, uh, it's a real mare's nest out here. Well, that was, uh, that was a, an idiom, you know, from the 1830s. The one that we really, really got into trouble for. In the 1830s vernacular, a screamer, You know, he says, I'm a screamer. A screamer was a highly influential person. And the first thing that the actor, Nimrod Wildfire, says when he's rehearsing his lines, and it's hard to pick up because it's cut so so quickly, but the first thing he says is, I'm a screamer. And, And of course, that's priest in Crockett's death scene where he makes the conscious decision because all through the film, he's conflicted. You know, there's this Davy Crockett guy. And finally, though, he knows he's at the end of his rope and he has to make a decision. Do I go out as David or do I go out as Davy, which which makes a more lasting statement? And and and, and he comes finally in the, in the last few moments of his life, he comes to terms with Davy, and uh, you know he says, "Well, you know, have Santana surrender to me. I'll talk to Houston. I'll try to save you know." And I, and he plays it for laughs, but uh, you know when when Santana's about to unleash the uh, soldados on him. He he looks at him and he smiles and he says, I need to warn you fellas, I'm a screamer. Now that doesn't mean like I'm going to scream like a little girl. And a lot of people who didn't understand that 1830s idiom really took offense at that, especially when when Billy Bob, next thing, he, he, he screams in defiance. So, you know, I think that was our fault for, for probably not explaining that better. Uh, you know, there's going to be some confusion there. But we, we just maybe assumed the audience would was smarter than it was, which is easy to do. But we caught a lot of grief from that. And something else that I think visually, we showed Crockett on his knees. And I think uh, a lot of people really took offense at, at that. That's the historical advice. Right? The day we were shooting that scene, I, I took uh, John Lee aside and I said, well, John Lee, historically, you know, uh, yes, uh, Crockett was killed after the battle, not unlike her showing. But the historical record shows that, you know, between four and six guys were with him and you're showing him by himself. And he said, yeah, I am. I said, well, you pay me 
to tell you what really happened. And I'm telling you, there are at least four other guys with him. And he said, well, what if we show these guys bound and dead on the ground as if they've already been killed and Crockett's just the last man standing? And I said, well, that, yeah, I mean, that is, I, I guess. And of course, in the final cut, we, we never see any of those guys. I think he just was trying to get rid of them. But, uh, you know, and he, and he told me, he says, well, you know, Steve, it's, it's, more, it's more dramatic if it's just Davey by himself. And I said, well, granted. And, uh, you know, he, he says, what, what works better cinematically? And I don't think it's a question that works better cinematically if it's just Crockett by himself. The last hurrah. Well, if we head back to the movie and, and the, the timeline there, while the Alamo is under siege, we see General Sam Houston trying to raise an army to come to the aid of the Alamo. He does raise some men, um, and there's some of his uh, other officers there who want to rush to aid the Alamo's defenders, but he keeps insisting that we need to wait until we have enough men. How well did the movie do showing what was going on for General Houston while the Alamo was under siege? Well, very well, because that's exactly the way it played out. I mean, Houston knew with the few men that he found in Gonzales, he said, yeah, I could take these men down to San Antonio and get them killed too. But at that point, he hasn't heard, well, he it hasn't happened yet. But the plan was uh, he was going to take the man that he found at Gonzales, he was going to fall back to the Colorado River and Fannin and his 400 men that are in Goliath are going to join him on the Colorado and combine the, the Texian forces. In the original script, we were going to show the siege of Bear, the Goliad, you know, we were going to do it all. And, uh, you know, when I, I, I had my first meeting, with Ron Howard, I said, how, how are you going to be able to, to do all this in, in, in an hour and a half? And he said, well, we're thinking more like three hours. I said, but still. And of course, when it came down to it, the Goliad, I mean, we actually went down to the Presidio La Bahia to see if we could shoot there. There was some communication in the movie that was going in and out of the Alamo. And I was curious about that side because I got the, you know, they're under siege, which to me means they're, there's not much going in and out. Um, but we do see some letters or messages kind of being sent in and out. Uh, what was that side of it like? And how much did the, the men in the Alamo know about what was going on with Houston and Fannin and, and Goliad and, and all that? Well, they didn't know a whole lot. They knew how long it took to get from Goliad to San Antonio. And they knew, why aren't they here yet? And the plan was, the strategic plan from the jump, is that uh, we're going to be this skeleton garrison here down on the frontier. Because remember... San Antonio was the southern frontier at that time. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to be a, a, a vital choke point here because El Camino Real comes through San Antonio and then up to Bastrop and then ultimately all the way to Nacogdoches and Louisiana. And, and the Alamo is blocking that road. So the plan is... Look, when, when you see the Mexicans holler out and the rest of Texas will siphon down to this vital choke point. Good plan. Not a bad plan. So why didn't it happen? Because the Texian government that would have organized those relief could have and should have organized those relief efforts uh, had uh, fallen apart in dissension and discord. So at this critical time, Texas doesn't really have a government. And nobody's concerned because everybody understands that uh, they're meeting in Washington on the 1st of March, and we're going to organize a new government anyway. So that's why nobody, but uh, by the time they organize 
that uh, new government, the men of the Alamo have fallen through the cracks. And not just the Alamo, the men at Goliad, too. So it was really a failure of leadership on the part of the, the rebel Texian government. It sounds like they were really reliant on that March 15th date of that's when the Mexicans are going to get here. Like they're not going to get here early uh, between Neil and between that and that side of it. And let's give credit where credit is due. Santana, that was a brilliant march. He got here. He stole the march on the Texans. He got here. He achieved strategic surprise. and. Uh, no, let's give him credit for that because, and, and uh, well, for the rest of the campaign, uh, the Texians were on their back foot. And, you know, he, and I point this out and people, people forget this, but the Texas Revolution splits conveniently into two parts, the campaign of 1835 and the campaign of 1836. And in the campaign of 1836, the Texians win every single battle. And in the, uh, in, in the campaign of 1836, the Texians lose every single battle, except the last one. And of course, history shows that sometimes just winning the last battle is enough. But, uh, you know, the campaign of, of 1836 was an unmitigated disaster and, and, until the victory at San Jacinto, where we pulled it, pulled it out of the fire. But, uh, you know, most people had, had written us off, you know, they said, look, they've, they've lost this war. Uh, even even some of the of the Texians who had were participating in the in the runaway scrape, they were they were getting you know trying to to get back across the Sabine. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. It's, you know, we talk about Dunkirk, the miracle of Dunkirk, but you know the miracle of San Jacinto. You no, know, the odds were against us. Earlier, you mentioned the battle itself at the Alamo and how that plan of attack. And the way that the movie shows that plan of attack, we see uh, the first charge is going to be led at the, the weak north wall, as they call it. Then they're going to attack from the northeast. They're going to come in from the east and from the south. Is that how they attacked? And I noticed, I didn't notice them say that they're going to attack from the west. Was there a reason why they didn't attack from the west? Well, actually, they did. Koss comes in at the, on the west wall. But many of his men get through embrasures on the west wall, but some of his men slop around the corner and end up on the north wall, too, because that's where the breakthrough was. But it was kind of there at the corner of the, the northwest corner. You know, that's where Koss's Kos, men come in, which, which we show that. But we also show them hitting the... Well, you remember in the movie where the... Uh, sappers the guys with the beards and the axes that's they're attacking the west wall they're cutting their way through uh, the west wall okay so that was that was then how they attacked there how about the the strategy of it as we see in the movie we see them get of course it, it is dark out and they sneak up as close as they can uh, we see uh, <laughs> david crockett uh, firing the very first shot which then uh, wakes up some of the the men in the alamo we departed from history we, we that's that's pure hollywood we got to have davy firing the first shot i figured that would be the case <laughs> but i had to ask historically it was all happening on the north wall but you know, we got to give we got to give Billy Bob something to do. So uh, yeah, we, we, we departed from history a little bit there. Well, you already talked about Bowie and when the way he died, but the way that we see uh, Travis die in the movie is that he gets shot near the wall, just kind of in in the middle of the battle. Was that how he died as well? Yes, we did. That was very true to history. He was shot in the head. Uh, we know that because Joe was as we show in the movie, uh, was standing right by him when he was hit. Now, was the bullet fired by this little Mexican kid? Pro well, probably not. But, you know, again, 
we had entered. Actually, he had a much larger role that kid did. But a lot of a lot of his scenes got cut, which sort of robbed that scene of a lot of its power because, you know, we just see this kid, you know, we don't really but he had been developed, you know, in the in the more extensive cut. But yeah, I mean, yeah, he was shot in the head and he fell down dead. And and then, as we also show in the movie, at that juncture, Joe, his body servant, leaves and go and, and, and ensconces himself in Travis's quarters. That's what Joe said he did. So that's what we showed. Well, at the very end of the movie, we see what happens in the aftermath of the Battle of the Alamo. We see Houston and his men and Santa Ana is trying to track them down. And to do that, he ends up splitting his own soldiers, sweeping them south, sweeping north. Uh, and then he takes some of his own men as well. And basically trying to wipe out Houston's army. And meanwhile, we see some dialogue where Houston is saying that he's going to follow the tactic that the Duke of Wellington did to defeat Napoleon, basically moving around and trying to stay one step ahead until Napoleon, in that case, makes a mistake. In this case, be Santa Ana making a mistake. And the way the movie shows it, that mistake happens when Santa Ana is just a couple miles from Houston. When they find out they're so close, Houston decides it's time they attack, and it's the Texians who overrun the Mexican army this time. And then at the very end, there is some text that says his army, Santa Ana's army, was defeated in just 18 minutes. Santa Ana himself was captured and ended up signing over all Mexican rights to Texas in exchange for his life. Is that pretty much how it happened? Pretty much how it happened. After the Alamo, uh, Santa Ana did not know exactly where Houston was. He knew he was out there, but Texas is a big place. So what he does is he splits his army up into what I describe in Texian Iliad as hunting parties. And the plan is, and it's a very Napoleonic plan, is that we will advance along parallel roads. And if you find Houston, sing out and we will all come together to, uh, to crush him. It didn't quite turn out that way. Santana finds out that the Mexican government is in Harrisburg, just a few miles away, and he has an opportunity to capture the entire rebel government. So he puts himself at the head of about 500 men and leaves his army and goes to Harrisburg and is told, oh, buddy, sorry, they left about 30 minutes ahead of you. And uh, they actually pursue them down to the coast, but Texan government gets in rowboats and rows out to Galveston. So just very, a very narrow escape. But we're always fond of saying here in Texas that Sam Houston and his army defeated the Mexican army at San Jacinto, and he did not do that. He defeated a very small contingent of the Mexican army that Santana very foolishly created that opportunity by separating himself. Now, when they sprang the trap on, on April 20th, uh, he sends down to Fort Ben and tells Cost, get up here. And uh, they arrive on the field about nine o'clock the next morning. And those additional Mexican reinforcements mean that they have numerical superiority. They now outnumber the Texans. But uh, they're dead on their feet, many of them. And this is one of the things that drives me crazy because I hear people say, well, we were able to defeat the Mexicans because they were taking a siesta. Now, of course, what goes unspoken is, isn't that just like a Mexican? Well, the fact of the matter is, those Mexican soldados, the one under Santana, or under Santana had been awake for almost 48 hours. They were walking zombies. And the ones under Koss had marched all night. And so they arrive on the field exhausted. And then they stand there. They expect the Texans will, uh, now this is April 21st again, they expect Houston will attack at dawn. 
which would have been the conventional wisdom, you know, so you can have the full light of day to fight your battle. Well, he doesn't. They expect him to attack at mid-morning. He doesn't. They expect him to attack at noon. He doesn't. So by uh, by four o'clock, Santana's officers go to him and says, look, uh, Your Excellency, um, if they haven't attacked by now, they're not going to, and our guys are dead on their feet. Can we have the guys stand down? And Santana says yes. And so, uh, I don't know if you've ever been so tired, been up so long, that when you finally go fall asleep, you get into the REM sleep, and some idiot calls you on the phone or rings the door or whatever, and you wake up and, and you're disoriented. Well, that's how the Mexican soldiers were. I mean, they fall asleep. They're, they're finally sound asleep. And when they wake up, the Texians are already in their camp. I don't think the physical state of the Mexican army is very often taken into account when we talk about the Battle of San Jacinto. I think we, we did show in the movie that we just massacred these guys. I mean, they were trying to surrender. We they were they were trying to swim across Peggy Lake, and we just literally shot them like fish in a barrel. They didn't have a chance. And yeah, the battle the battle lasted eighteen minutes, but the slaughter the slaughter lasted much longer. The slaughter uh, lasted until nightfall. But by attacking that late in the day, by attacking about well. The primary accounts vary, but about 4.30 this is my best guess. Did Houston know that about how tired they were? No, it was just, in, in fact, uh, attacking that late in the day was a testament that we just couldn't get our act together till then. <laughs> yeah. He called an officer's meeting. Uh, this, this is not shown in the movie, because in the movie, of course, Sam Houston has to be this grand and glorious hero. I don't think he was. What Sam Houston wants to do is retreat into East Texas because he knows that there is an American army under uh, General Gaines uh, at Fort Jessup, which is on the east bank of the Sabine in Louisiana. We've got an American army. And he also, and, and he, he is uh, keeping in touch with Gaines, and we know that because some of the couriers say, well, you know, I was, Houston sent me to deliver dispatches to Gaines, so we, we know that. So they're keeping in touch, right? And uh, I think what Houston wants to do is lure Santana into East Texas and lure him across the Natchez River, not, not the Nueces in South Texas, but the Natchez in East Texas. Because Andrew Jackson has told General Gaines, we will not tolerate a Mexican army on our border. And if the Mexicans cross the Natchez, attack them, cross the Sabine, engage them. In some of my writings, I, I call that Houston's American strategy. Now, what does the American strategy do? If he can trigger American involvement, I, I think it's pretty certain that the American army defeats Santana and the Mexican army, especially in East Texas, where the terrain favors you know, the way we fight, and when his lines of communication and supply have been stretched to the breaking point. And what's more important, what has up to that point been a Texas war becomes an American war. And once Americans have some skin in the game, what Houston is betting on is that that's, they're going to be invested now. And 
I think most of the people at uh, at the town of Washington who signed uh, that thought that this was just a stopgap measure. And I think most of them think that that Texas is going to join the union in maybe six months to a year, but not the decade that it it eventually took them to join the union. But I I think that was Houston's plan. And on that at that officers meeting, at that officers meeting at noon, he says, Hey guys, you know, it's not too late. We could build a floating bridge across Buffalo Bayou. We could retreat to East Texas. We could do that. And people just look at him and say, Sam, we're here. They're here. We're never going to get this chance again. You know what Houston said? He said, fight then and be down. Now, this is uh, several sources. Quote him. So it's not just one source or two sources, but several sources remember. And, they, and, and I think the reason they remember that is that's an odd thing for a commanding general to say. So I, I think it's safe to say that Houston was not committed to battle as late as noon on April 21st. He was still clinging to what I call the American strategy because he realizes that a battle at San Jacinto, even if it is a Texian victory. It's a Texian victory. It's not an American victory. He needs an American victory to make this an American war so he can get Texas into the Union. Because a a Texian victory does not satisfy his political goals, which has always been to get Texas into the Union. Speaking of Houston there at the last battle, in the movie, that's the first time we hear the term, remember the Alamo. He uses that in the speech to his men. Did he actually use it there? When was the first time that that was used? Actually, he probably used it for the first time at Harrisburg. And we don't really know who coined the phrase, but uh, certainly it was taken up. Uh, There is no doubt that the soldiers, that was their battle cry. It was, uh, well, actually it was, remember the Alamo, remember La Bahia. Uh, Probably not remember Goliath, it was probably remember La Bahia. But we we tend uh, to forget Goliad in the mix. But, uh, and of course, in a movie called The Alamo, we're really not going to, you know. So, uh, but but yeah, they would have said, remember the Alamo. Remember. And in fact, if you, if you look at the accounts, most of the Texian soldiers were more incensed at the Goliad massacre because they, they were under the impression that those guys had surrendered and had been promised their lives. Uh, as it turns out that they hadn't. You know, it was it was a deplorable episode. However, it went down completely unnecessary. But uh, these people were uh, wanting payback, and by God, they got it. And and I think the uh, the, the movie uh, it does a pretty good job of depicting that. I mean, there's the scene where Sam Houston is a ceasefire, ceasefire. They completely ignore him. There's the scene where Juan Seguin. It's just, uh, you know, all these Mexican bodies. And these are, after all, his countrymen. And he's, you know, we see him fall to his knees, you know, like, oh, my God, what have I done? And yes, these Mexicans were the enemy, but they were Mexicans. You walk an emotional tightrope, you know. And, And I think the movie shows that too. Now, the character of Juan Seguin, let's, let's talk about Seguin, because we, we really, uh, <laughs> uh, we fudged. Uh, first, he, in the movie, Seguin is uh, Houston's moral compass, right? That they're good friends and uh, and whatnot. In fact, uh, Houston 
knew Seguin probably, but they weren't buds. And Seguin didn't speak English. Never learned to speak English. So, of course, all through the movie, we have Seguin speaking English. No. No, that's a fudge. But it, but at least, you know, being a, a creative decision, right, to make it easier for the for the viewer, I'm sure. Well, you know, we, we wanted to acknowledge the uh, Tejanos, and, and Juan Seguin being the most prominent Tejano. It was a natural thing to do, but we, we probably... Uh, well, another thing, we show uh, uh, the Tejanos uh, charging in, in, a, in a cavalry charge. Uh, all the Tejanos uh, at San Jacinto were, were with Sherman fighting as infantry. But John Lee said, well, you know, they, you know, people expect Tejanos to be on horseback. That's eh, a fudge. But, yeah. Is there anything that you wish had gotten a chance to be included in the movie that wasn't? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, as, you know, a guy who has written on this, you know, I was really excited when I read the script and saw that they were going to include a scene depicting the breakout at the Alamo. I mean, the guy's actually jumping the walls and trying to escape and uh, they get caught out in the open by the the Mexican Lancers. I I think that's a, I mean, I write about that in Texian Iliad and uh, I always thought that would be a a really dramatic scene. And and, and by the way, if you, if you can get hold of uh, Frank Thompson's making of book, it's got the shooting script and you can see what we shot. And what you saw, and uh, all this footage is floating out there somewhere. But when it came time to shoot at night, we had these enormous, and I mean enormous, lights. And they were installed at, at several hundred yards away. And they just cast, well, it looked like moonlight. But it gave us enough light. It still looked dark. Apparently, these lights, you know, came from from California, and they were they were god awful expensive. The rental on these, and uh, you no, know, we were shooting the night scenes. And uh, I was talking to John Lee, and he said, uh, "Well, this is you know, this is the last night of uh, of night shooting." I said, "Well, John Lee, what?" What about the breakout? We haven't shot the breakout. He said, "No, we're not. We're not going to be able to shoot that. Uh, you know, we've we've got to get these lights back." And I was just crushed. And I told him, I said, "You know, that's never been done in any Alamo movie. We could have really distinguished ourselves if, if we had added that." And I think it would have been because, as it was described in the uh, in the scene. You see all these guys jumping over the wall, but the camera follows just one of the actors that we've kind of gotten to know. And we see him running through the dark. And he's looking behind him, you know. And he turns around and... <laughs> and he gets a lance right in his chest. And I could see that. I can still see that in my head. And uh, it was all because we had used up our light time. And so uh, that broke my heart. That absolutely broke my heart that we weren't able to. Because that was that was the one scene that I was really excited about. Because no other Alamo movie has ever shown. To this day. To this day. That's never been shown. Those are the things that you don't really think about when you're watching a movie. Like, you know, they leave something out. You don't think about, oh, it was because they were renting these lights and they had to return them. So he can't shoot it anymore. Yeah, that's right. It sometimes comes down to just something that prosaic. Can I tell you the scene in the movie that I absolutely hate and I cringe every time I see it? Yeah. It's the scene where uh, Crockett shoots off Santana's epaulette. Remember that scene? Yeah, he shoots it off his shoulder. He's he's aiming right there, pulls out. Yep, yep. Yeah, 
you know, I thought that was so hokey and so Hollywood. Now, we know, we know he was a great shot. And we know from Mexican sources that many soldados were shot at distances they thought were impossible. And I expect Crockett, you know, was, was doing the firing. And that would have been great just to show him shooting a Mexican soldado. But no, it can't just be a soldado. It's got to be Santana. And, and, and we've got to shoot off his epaulet. And we have to suggest that he did that on purpose. And I just, that is so Hollywood and so false. I hate that scene. And every time I watch the movie, I just think, God, really, really? It did stand out as as being very implausible because he's he goes out there by himself. Santana is by, out there by himself. Nobody else is around him. Perfect target. Yeah, uh, and uh, I just I just thought that yeah, who who but a Hollywood screenwriter could have come up with with this nonsense? But you know, there are more. I think there are more good scenes than scenes like that. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about the Alamo. I know you've. Got some great books about the history of Texas. So for someone listening to this who wants to learn more, which of your books would you recommend that they start with? And then can you share where they can pick up a copy? Well, you know, to start with, I have a book called Lust for Glory. Lust for Glory, an epic story of early Texas and the sacrifice that defined a nation. And the nation I'm talking about is not the United States of America. It's the Republic of Texas. And I wrote that book not for my academic colleagues, but for students and their teachers and their parents and for people who maybe took seventh grade Texas history many years ago and have forgotten a lot of the details. And uh, that book covers the 25-year period between 1821 and uh, 1846, sort of like what led up to the Alamo. The Alamo, what followed the Alamo, what were the consequences of the Alamo? And, uh, I mean, I talk about the period of of the Republic of Texas. So that's a that's a good introductory book. But if you're if you're into military history, my book, Texian Iliad, a military history of the Texas Revolution, uh, you know, we really get into the weeds, the nitty-gritty of the of the military history. I've got another book, which is actually my favorite of all the books I've written. It's called Texian Macabre, uh, the uh, melancholy a tale of a hanging in early Houston. It's a story of Houston during that period, during the period of the Republic of Texas, where Houston served as the capital of Texas. And, uh, you know, people think of uh, Deadwood as being a rough and woolly place, but uh, early Houston was just bedlam, you know. So uh, I had a lot of fun with that book. Uh, my, mo- my most recent, but I say it's my book, it's a, it was an editing job called uh, Robert Coleman's Houston Displayed or Who Won the Battle of San Jacinto, an obscure 1837 pamphlet that was highly, highly, highly critical of Houston's generalship, Houston's character, Houston's fashion choices, Houston's horse. Coleman really hated Houston. And he makes it clear in this book. But what I found uh, when I started comparing what Coleman is saying to what other people are saying is that uh, nine times out of ten, a Coleman is telling the truth. Uh, he might be doing it in a vituperative way. And that's the problem. Uh, historians and biographers of Houston have dismissed this little pamphlet. This is, well, it's just, you know, he's grinding axes he's biased well he is biased but that doesn't mean you can completely disregard this uh, critical primary account it was other than houston's a post-battle report to president burnett it was the earliest account 
of the Battle of San Jacinto by a participant met uh, for uh, for popular consumption. And there's there's uh, information in that little 38-page pamphlet uh, that you can find nowhere else. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud. Uh, it was published by the De Geyer, uh, Library at SMU and the Clements Center there at SMU. Beautiful, beautiful production. It's a fine press book, limited edition. But... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of, of how that came together. By the way, I've got a website, and it's uh, to find it, it's the simplicity itself. It's Stephen L. Harden, Stephen L. Harden, all lowercase, all one word, dot com. And uh, there are links there to all of my books. It'll take you to Amazon. You can get my books. And also, I've got some pretty interesting content also on, on the website. It has to do with Texas history, Texas Revolution. If you have an interest in the Texas Revolution, Texas history, or uh, especially, you know, things I've done during the course of my career, uh, yeah, check it out. You might, might find something that, that will engage your interest. Fantastic. And I'll make sure to add links to all of that in the show notes for this episode as well. I appreciate that. Thank you again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. I'd like to thank Stephen Harden for sharing his expertise about the historical accuracy of the 2004 movie, The Alamo. If you want to learn even more about the events leading up to, during, and after the Battle of the Alamo, be sure to check out Stephen's great books that he mentioned at the end there, like Lust for Glory and Texian Iliad. You can find links to his books in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one. The final assault on the Alamo took place in darkness. Number two, the Battle of the Alamo was a fight between Mexico and the United States. Number three, William Travis was temporarily in charge of the Alamo when the siege began. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. The final assault on the Alamo took place in darkness. That is true. As Stephen explained, and as we see in the movie, the final assault began early in the morning and it ended before the sun came up. So, for all intents and purposes, it was a night battle. That brings us to number two. The Battle of the Alamo was a fight between Mexico and the United States. That is the lie. As Stephen explained, even though their goal was to eventually join the United States at the time of the Battle of the Alamo, the men defending the Alamo were part of the Republic of Texas, which was not part of the United States at the time. That means number three is also true. William Travis was temporarily in charge of the Alamo when the siege began. Just like we see in the movie, the commander of the Alamo was J.C. Neal. With the winter weather being particularly bad that year, they didn't expect the Mexican army to arrive when it did. So Neal had left Travis as interim commander of sorts while he was attending to a family matter. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. I know that's not something that most podcasts do. That's exactly why I'm sharing this information. There's one thing that is surprising to most people who are new to podcasting or have never created a podcast before. It's just how much time goes into creating them. So I figure maybe if you find out more about how much time and money goes into creating a podcast like mine, then maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 28 hours to create and cost $27.13 in out-of-pocket expenses. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 28 hours does not include the countless hours of my guest time researching the subject matter we talked about, and also does not include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not part of creating this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, social media, the Based on a True Story email newsletter, and all those other little things outside creating an actual podcast episode that are still required to make a podcast. 
Similarly, on the expenses side, that $27.13 is just for things specifically for this one episode. It does not include all the podcast-related expenses that go beyond making a single episode. For example, the cost of the microphone that I'm talking into right now, the cables hooked up to the microphone, the audio interface that they're plugged into, the computer that it's recording on, the software that I'm using to record, and all the podcast and website hosting costs, and on and on. All those things take time to set up and maintain, and they cost money that goes beyond things that are associated with just this one episode, but they're all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, there wouldn't be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that is why I am so thankful for the wonderful people who are helping to support this show financially so we can keep it going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a bonus, you'll get access to over 60 exclusive episodes on the producer's feed. Over there, we look at how completely fictional movies deal with history and real life to make them seem a little more believable. For example, we've covered the history in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean, Jurassic Park, the entire Back to the Future franchise, the Mummy franchise, and plenty more. You can find out how to get access to that by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. In the meantime, if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll share it with a friend. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.